welcome you to this meeting of the Temple Baptist Church. God bless you for being here. I want us to stand together. We're going to pray and ask God's blessing on our meeting. Let me welcome the friends who are joining us as we live stream the services. And uh, we're grateful that we're broadcasting live on the radio and we have listeners there who are praying with us and praying for us. And we're very grateful for that. And I certainly appreciate all of you being here. I want you to pray for me. May the Lord guide us and help us in every way. Let's pray together, may we? Our fathers, we come before thee. We thank thee, Lord, that we have this high holy privilege to come into thy presence to make our request known to thee. We recognize that the victory is in thee. Help us to trust in thee and lean upon thee and to all do our part, praying and believing, moving forward by faith. Touch this meeting for thy glory. Help us as we preach thy word and teach thy word. May Christ be so evident in this place as we meet together. In his precious name we pray, amen. While you're standing, you take our hymn book, please. Turn to hymn number 264. 264. We're going to do things just a little bit different. At the conclusion of the meeting, we're going to have a special prayer time. And so we'll announce a few things early, but then we'll all pray together at the conclusion. And I want you to be ready to pray and let's meet the Lord. The victories are won by faith, believing the Lord. And the warfare we're engaged in, we've already won. Because Christ is the victor, no doubt about that. So let's sing this with all of our heart. Number 264. I wandered in the shades of night till Jesus came to me. All together now. I wandered in the shades of night till Jesus came to me. And with the sunlight of his love did all my darkness be. Sunlight, sunlight in my soul today. Sunlight, sunlight all along the way. Since the Savior found me, took away my sin. I have heard the sunlight of his love within. No clouds may gather in the sky and fills out the bowl. However dark the world may be, I've sunlight in my soul. Sunlight, sunlight in my soul today. Sunlight, sunlight all along the way. Since the Savior found me, took away my sin. I have heard the sunlight of His love within. While walking in the light of God, I seek to be divine. My blessed holy figure only keep the world behind. Sunlight, sunlight in my soul today. Sunlight, sunlight all along the way. Since the Savior found me, took away my sin. I have held the sunlight of His love within. I cross the wide extended fields, I journey on the plain. And in the sunlight of His love, I reap the golden grain. Sunlight, sunlight in my soul today. Sunlight, sunlight all along the way. Since the Savior found me, took away my sin. I have had the sunlight of His love within. So I shall see Him as He is the light that came to me. Behold the brightness of His face throughout eternity. Sunlight, sunlight in my soul today. Sunlight, sunlight all along the way. Since the Savior found me, took away my sin. I have had the sunlight of His love within. Amen. Amen. Our choir is singing now. In the audience, you may be seated. We're happy to hear the choir sing a song that stirs our hearts. It's entitled, Till the Storm Passes By.
Thank you, choir. We want our men to come with the prayer sheet in hand. If you need a copy, would you raise your hand, please, and let them bring one your way. And while they're coming, let me wish a happy 18th birthday to Daniel and David Plott, who are celebrating tomorrow. And a happy birthday to Mr. Bill Bridges, who celebrated yesterday. May God bless him. I hope you'll take the time to look in the prayer sheet at all the wonderful things going on in the life and ministry of Temple Baptist Church. We'll have our time of prayer at the end of the meeting, as Pastor said earlier. But gentlemen, please note especially the Faithful Men's Banquet and do your best this week to invite others to be with you on that special banquet Saturday, January the 30th. And we're looking forward to God doing great things in our Faithful Men's Meeting to follow that. Let's take our hymn books out, if you would, please. And our men are coming back in just a moment to greet those who are visiting with us. We see a number of guests with us, and we're happy you're here. For those who are our church members, we're going to sing together hymn number 194 in just a moment. Would you find that, please, in your hymn book, hymn number 194? And we'll ask all of our guests to remain seated. Our men are coming to greet you, and they have something special to put in your hands, and we'd love to have a record of your visit, and you can leave that with us in just a few moments in the offering plate, and we appreciate that so much. And we notice some are here who haven't been with us for a few weeks, and they're back now, and some young people are back, and we're, we're glad about that. We want to encourage them all we can. If you call the Temple Baptist Church your church home, let's stand together all around, and let's sing this great hymn as Dr. Thompson leads us. Are lifted at Calvary. Days are filled with sorrow. are coming forward to receive our offering this evening. I'd like to ask Stephen Scoggins if he would come and lead us in prayer in just a moment. We're trusting God to meet every need and we're so very grateful for the opportunity we have as we gather to worship at each service to have this way to worship the Lord in our giving. I hope you're a tither by conviction and you're giving above and beyond the tithe with the offering. And so we're encouraging all of our people to be faithful as we worship the Lord this evening. And also, we're encouraging people to give online. If you're watching online, we'd encourage you to do that. You can go to our website. There's a very simple way to do that. But let's be faithful as the Lord has been so very faithful to us. And so let's pray together as Stephen leads us. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, we come to you tonight as grateful people. Lord, we're thankful for all you've done in our lives, Lord. And we thank you for how you're working in this place. And Lord, thank you for... Uh, even this week, the souls have been saved and, and what you're doing here in this place. I pray, Lord, you continue to bless and guide us. I pray, Lord, you bless this offering now and uh, be of pastor as he brings the message, Lord. Speak to our hearts. In your name I pray. Amen.
Amen. That's a blessing. Living by faith. Pastor's coming with God's word in just a moment. Let's pray for him as he comes. Have our Bibles ready. And just before he comes, Jonathan is coming to sing. And his song is entitled, How Wonderful Art Thou. majestic skies and oh behind them is a God all wise who fix the stars each in its lonely place and wrapped them in a darkened robe of space My God, how wonderful art Thou to love the world while hands before Thee bow. I fail to comprehend it all. distant space and I think of how out of matchless grace is coming in the clouds to claim his own such wonders that on earth cannot be known I scan the heavens rapture in my soul and wonder how the God who made the whole could ever fix his thoughts on such as I and give his son on the cross to I'd like you to take the word of God, please, and turn with me to the New Testament book of Romans. And we'll begin in the first chapter of the book of Romans with the first verse. I have a theme and thesis for this message that I, I hope will come across to you from my heart to your heart. I've entitled it Righteous in Rome. Of all places, Righteous in Rome. God would desire that we live righteously in any place, but especially in what we might deem the most difficult place. So as Paul takes pen in hand and writes these words under the inspiration of the Spirit of God, beginning with Romans chapter 1 and verse 1, we read, Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, separated to the gospel of God, which he had promised afore by his prophets in the Holy Scriptures. Concerning his son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, which was made of the seed of David according to the flesh, 
and declared to be the Son of God with power according to the spirit of holiness by the resurrection from the dead, by whom we have received grace and apostleship for obedience to the faith among all nations for his name, among whom are ye also the called of Jesus Christ. To all that be in Rome, beloved of God, called to be saints, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. First, I thank my God through Jesus Christ for you all that your faith is spoken of throughout the whole world. For God is my witness whom I serve with my spirit in the gospel of his son that without ceasing I make mention of you always in my prayers, making requests if by any means now at length I might have a prosperous journey by the will of God to come unto you. For I long to see you, that I may impart unto you some spiritual gift to the end ye may be established, that is, that I may be comforted together with you by the mutual faith, both of you and me. Now, I would not have you ignorant, brethren, that oft times I purposed to come unto you, but was let hitherto, that I might have some fruit among you also, even as among the Gentiles. I am debtor both to the Greeks and to the barbarians, both to the wise and to the unwise. So as much as in me is, I am ready to preach the gospel to you that are at Rome also. I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith. It is written, the just shall live by faith. If you're in the habit of marking things in your Bible, I want you to mark the expression in verse 7, in Rome. In Rome. In this particular geographical location, in this city of Rome, in this center, in this place, in Rome. And then I want you to notice the word in verse 17, for therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith. As is written, the just shall live by faith. And the word righteousness, I call your attention to. Righteousness revealed. How will people know the righteousness of God if it's lived out in the lives of God's children? The Bible tells us that first in Antioch, people were called Christians who were true followers of the Lord Jesus. Why did they call them Christians first there in Antioch? Because they were Christ-like in their behavior. Paul, writing to these Roman Christians, says to them, it's God's requirement for you to live righteously, to demonstrate the righteousness of God in Rome. In Rome. I remind you that Roman Caesars, leaders, many Roman dignitaries, lived the most perverse lives. They were powerful people who thought they could take anything they wanted if it were available to them, if they saw it, if they desired it, they could take it for their own. J. Vernon McGee said at least nine, perhaps 11 out of the first 13 people who ruled in Rome were either bisexual in their behavior or homosexual. They felt like any aged person was free game to them. And they lived these perverse lifestyles. People have the idea sometimes if everything falls into proper place, politically, geographically, in every way in life, then we can live the way God wants us to live. But God has so designed the Christian life that no matter who rules, if Christ rules in our lives, we can live victoriously. 
That's the point I want to get across to you. I have people I prefer to be ruling. I'd like to think they have some of the same convictions that I have as a Christian. I'd like to think that they're favorable to the Bible and to Bible-believing people. I'd like to think that on the great issues of life, they would stand where we stand. But if that's not the case, it does not deter us from living faithfully the Christian life that God has designed. Many people just live half the Christian life. I mean by that, that they come to the place where they, they believe everything the Bible says about the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, ask God to forgive their sin, and by faith trust Christ as Savior. But they do not follow through to live in the power of the resurrected Christ, to live in the power of the Holy Spirit, the victory over sin. And I say to you, what good is it to be forgiven of our sins and then to live in it? Many Christians live in it and they blame somebody or something or some circumstance for their failure. Now, I hope you're reading through the lines. I hope you understand. Even if I'm not pleased with the people who may serve in certain offices, and I'll say more about that in a moment, it does not keep me or you from living the life God's designed for us to live. As a matter of fact, in one sense, we're to live the Christian life as if there were no other circumstantial things involved in it. I mean by that, if things are not going to your favor or your pleasure, you still can live the Christian life. Now, with all that's going on in our, in our world and especially in our nation, of course, I'm very displeased with some things that have taken place. I am pleased with some people and honestly disgusted with other people because of their cowardice, lack of loyalty to principle and this type of thing. But I have to stand at the crossroads of all of that and ask myself, is that going to keep me from being a victorious Christian? Is it? Can I live righteously in Rome? Can I do the right thing no matter what others are doing? And the answer is yes. There's no doubt in my mind about that. The answer is yes. Tragic things are happening. History will write the honest record, I hope, of all of it. I have my opinions and you have yours. But we must live our lives as Christians in such a genuine fashion that it does not, it does not defeat us. I don't want you to be defeated. I have some very important things to say to you and I want you to make note of them. Paul here is writing to these Christians in Rome. Think, in Rome, Nearly a million people lived in the city of Rome and the outskirts and surrounding area. Half of them were slaves. There was all kinds of filth and debauchery. You couldn't live in the city of Rome without seeing it and being a witness to it. Things were so bad, if you didn't want a child, you just got rid of it, threw it in the garbage. Can you imagine? Can you imagine? Maybe there was something you deemed wrong with a particular child. You could discard that particular child. Perhaps someone would pick it up out of the refuge. Perhaps they wouldn't. It was a sewer of sinful behavior. Everywhere you went, there was not only the stench of sewer because the city with all of its water supply was not adequately prepared for all the waste that came through it. But worse than the stench of the sewer was the stench of sinful behavior. Living in Rome was not all it was cracked up to be. 
But if you were a Christian and you were there, God's expectation for you was the same it would have been no matter where you happened to be living. Now, as we face the day in which we live, there are some people thinking, tell me when the battle's on so I can wake up. The truth of the matter is, it's on this moment. And if you don't wake up soon, there'll be many defeats and the devil will win many victories before you awaken to the fact that the war is actually taking place. Someone has said with the new elected officials that we have in America, there are certain things Christians can expect because they've already declared their intentions. Think of that. As a matter of fact, the president-elect has declared that the first thing he's going to do is open every public school restroom and every public school sports team to every transgendered person in the school. He means by that that the restrooms would be open to male or female, whichever you declare yourself to be, no matter what you are biologically. This is just one of the things. And it's not just that people are going to allow these things, they're going to promote these things. I want to read something to you and I hope you take heart and don't drop dead before I finish because I have some encouraging things to say to you. This administration of presumptive president-elect Joe Biden and vice president-elect Kamala Harris is certain to implement policies and initiatives that litigate specific things and at best be in tension or morally opposed to Christians in this country. Moral positions on Christians that are repugnant to us and infringe upon the exercise of religious faith in the public square. In other words, they're going to do anything they can do that will be in the face of believers especially people who say we believe the Bible and adhere to Scripture. Biden has repeatedly personally affirmed the morality of abortion. In other words, this is the moral way to do things without any meaningful restrictions. That's their language. As promised to facilitate access and procurement of abortion on demand, financed by all of our taxpayer dollars. For example, he will almost certainly re-implement regulations from the Obama administration prohibiting states that receive federal funds for families planning from withholding payment on abortion mills such as Planned Parenthood. In other words, the United States of America has become so dependent, our school systems have become so dependent upon federal funding that they know they can't operate without it. And so, to punish people who won't comply with all these new moral regulations, which are immoral regulations, they withhold all funding. They will eliminate accommodations for any Catholic group or whatever the case may be. No one can escape. They now support the repealing of the Hyde Amendment this legislation that has prohibited direct funding of abortion since 1977. Thus, tax revenue collected from Christians and others opposed to abortion will be used directly to fund abortion in a Biden administration. They want to make an example out of anyone who will oppose them. Can you live the Christian life in all of that? They also plan to suspend the Mexico City policy, which prohibits international aid that provides or finances abortions in developing countries. In other words, when President Obama was the President of the United States, he would not give federal aid to any foreign country that would not comply to his abortion standards. All of that is going to be renewed. 
is also promised to re-implement aggressive Obama-era policies imposing secular gender ideology on all aspects of public life. This is not just in our school systems. And I'll read something to you from another article in World Magazine in just a moment. But the whole thing, the whole thing about promoting Students to use locker rooms and restrooms and showers of students choosing regardless of their students' biological sex. In other words, you can expect in the school system that young men are going to walk into young ladies' restrooms declaring that they're transsexual and they're really young women. You say, I really don't want my kids to hear this. Don't make me laugh. Your children are not only going to hear it, they're going to hear it on the news, they're going to hear it, they're going to have it driven down their throats. This executive order even made it a violation for a school administrator to question the authenticity of a student's gender identity. For instance, if you're a principal of a school or a teacher of a school and some student comes to you and declares their gender identity to be something different from their biological makeup, you cannot question it unless you want to be guilty of a hate crime. A Biden Justice Department will oppose states' efforts to prevent biological males from displacing females in high school athletics, forcing girls to the sidelines while boys dominate female athletic events. Now this has already been practiced in several states so it's not going to be a hard thing for them to implement. They also indicate that they're going to support what they call the so-called Equality Act, which has passed the House and has been championed by Harris in the Senate. This legislation is designed to impose gender ideology even beyond schools and other institutions that receive federal funding. So you can be taken to court on a job somewhere where you deny someone their gender identity. Its purpose is to force businesses and other public institutions not merely to accommodate people according to their gender identity, but rather to affirm an ideology that violates the moral commitments of most Christians. This forces citizens to say or affirm, think of this, that you are to declare as a Christian falsehoods about sex and gender. The act will make it a violation for a person's civil rights. For example, to refuse to use pronouns that accord with a person's stated gender identity rather than his or her biological sex. Such refusal could actionable they bring sexual harassment charges against you. As far as religious liberty is concerned, get ready for hate, hate crimes. Now think about the, what we're going to have to be able to do to preach the Bible, what the Bible says. A Biden-Harris administration will also directly assault religious liberty. Harris has been strong supporter of the do no harm act. Doesn't it sound great? Do no harm act. This was brought up in the Senate and she will almost certainly make it a priority of the new administration. The purpose of the act is to subvert, if not practically eliminate the federal religious freedom restoration act and similar legislation in many states implemented after the 1990 Supreme court case employment division Division versus Smith. The laws are designed to protect sincerely held religious practices from otherwise generally applicable laws that prohibit them. So down with those laws that protect your religious rights and your liberty. Of course, no politician, law or regulation or policy can take anyone's religious faith away but they will make it very costly to practice your faith. Are you ready for the cost? This is America. This is what we now have. 
We had a small window. A small window through which to do some things that we had opportunity to do under President Trump. That window is now closed. The president-elect and vice president have made it very clear that they intend to do these things. I want to read this to you. This is already going on in Washington State. Since January, children in Washington State, aged 13 and up, can obtain confidential treatment for what they call mental health conditions and gender dysphoria. In using their parents' insurance plan without their parents' consent. In other words, a 13 year old can come to a counselor in the state of Washington and say that they're confused with their gender and they need help. Now, the state is considering a bill to set up health clinics on middle school and high school campuses. Parents fear these clinics will talk children into dangerous and irreversible medical treatments such as puberty blockers and cross-sex hormones to make their body look more like the opposite sex. It's become a very popular thing. Now they can do it without their parents' permission and they can even use their parents' health insurance plan to get it done. Many states, including Washington, have teenage girls already leaving classes to get abortions or obtain contraceptives without any parent ever knowing what's going on. That's in the federally funded public schools. My heart breaks when I think about these things. It does. What opportunity, what chance do some of these kids have and many young people go through confusing times in their life and wonder what they are, what they're going to do. And these monsters are seizing upon those moments to irreversibly change a child's life to achieve their goals. I just happened to find this, a doll that's been out for a while, a doll for everyone. It meets Mattel's gender-neutral doll requirements. A child opens a box, he starts jumping and screaming with joy. Not an unusual sound in the halls of the toy headquarters where researchers test new toys. But this particular toy is a doll and it's rare for parents to bring boys into research groups to play with dolls, but they do. It's rare still for a boy to immediately attach himself to one the way this particular child would do. An eight-year-old who considers himself gender fluid, which means he doesn't know yet what he is. There are states, not just one, there are states, plural, where a parent can go when the child is born and put on his or her birth certificate whatever they desire the gender of that child to be. And so, an eight-year-old who considers himself gender fluid whose favorite color is black, one week pink, the next sometimes something else, plays with his younger sister's dolls at home. But they're girly, princess type dolls. Now the doll has been designed by the toy company so it can be either or. And this can accompany you on your gender search. The doll can be a boy, a girl, or neither, or both which calls the world's first gender neutral doll a certain name and it's hoping to launch this doll and they already know that it's going to be a bestseller. Their first promotional spot for the $29.99 product features a series of kids who go by various pronouns, him, her, them, M, X, E, M, and the slogan, a doll line designed to keep labels out and invite everyone in. With this overt and nod to trans and non-binary identities, the company is betting on where it thinks the country is going 
even if it means alienating a substantial portion of the United States population who are Bible-believing Christians. Now, now we have an executive branch in government who not only believes all of this, is going to do everything they can to promote it. I wonder, do you realize we're in a war? Whatever was going on in Rome, Paul said it's still incumbent for you to live the Christian life. Whatever's going on in America, whatever's being promoted, you and I are still to live the Christian life. There is an attack upon the family. Why not? God designed it as the foundation for all else. And when we know the foundation and function of the family from the word of God, it answers all the questions that people have that are strange things now. Strange to you, strange to me, but be more, are becoming more accommodating to so many, so many people. There is an attack on gender identity. Can you imagine how confused this generation is going to be when there are thousands of young men, thousands of them, who have already received puberty blockers whose bodies will never develop as a man? Think of it, or don't think of it, but it's going on. How much confusion, this is an age of compound confusion anyway, but how much confusion is going on? But God says, if we're living here, you say, I don't like it, I don't either. I don't think it's right, it shouldn't have happened. I don't either. 80 million people didn't vote for it. I think you're right. But people may be going to jail because they're saying that now. I don't think you and I have come to grips with the transformation that has already taken place in our country. Now, it doesn't mean, it doesn't mean that we have no hope. It doesn't mean that there's nothing we can do about it. But it does mean that we're going to be living in a country that's gone through a radical change now with elected executive officers of the United States who are sworn and vowing to do everything they can to promote it. We used to say abortion is a big battle, and it is. 60 million aborted babies in America. How can God not act on the blood of all those children? But now one thing added to the other, added to the other, added to the other. The school systems... And I, I love our school children, our public school children, our Christian school children, all children. But they can't operate their school without federal funding. And they can't receive federal funding unless they enact these things. And following behind all of that, different ideas about when America was founded, Curriculum prepared to teach young people that America is a bad place, built on the backs of slaves, dividing families where children who are school age will come home and rebel against their parents because their parents hold some old conviction about something they were taught when the child is saying, you weren't taught the truth, there is a new truth and there is no such thing as a new truth. What's happening? What are we going to do? We still must live righteous in Rome. Now, if we spend all our time talking about the government, what we don't like about the government, we're going to spend our energy on the wrong thing. I think we should state things 
you're going to have to be a little more careful about where you say it and when you say it. People were kicked off airlines the other day for saying things just like I've just said. Large com companies that some of you and some of us have respect for have already come out and said that they've cut off funding to anyone who was ever a Trump supporter. In other words, you don't have free speech anymore in America. But we must speak freely our convictions about God's word. But our argument is not just politically oriented. We must speak the truth in love. And we all must have these things. I want you to write them down. Number one, we must have courage. Courage. We haven't even known what courage is. You can take it or leave it. You can speak out or not speak out. You can be a witness or not be a witness. You can proclaim that Jesus is the only way of salvation. There's a real heaven and a real hell. But now it's going to take courage to say that like never before. I want to show you a verse of scripture. I wanted to read to you all the things that God said to Joshua, but I'll at least show you this. In the closing part of the book of Acts, Paul arrives at Rome. And I just noticed this in the 28th chapter. In verse 16, the Bible says they came to Rome. But in verse 15, the word of God says, and from thence, when the brethren heard of us, they came to meet us as far as Appia Forum and the three taverns, whom when Paul saw, it might have been Epaphroditus, I do not know, no one knows for sure, but they planned on Paul's journey to Rome to intercept him in a certain place. And the Bible says when Paul saw them, notice please, he thanked God and took courage. Even the apostle Paul, he thanked God and took courage. Would you listen, please? You and I need to learn how to thank God and take courage. Courage grows out of our faith. It must be anchored there. It may take courage that we've never thought we needed to be speaking out loud about things. I'm saying this with all kindness and love, but some of our people have gotten so cowardly about illness. And illness is real. It's real. I just want you to consider one thing. Where will you eventually be if you don't face this illness with courage? Where will it take you? How will your life end? What kind of person will you become held up at home, afraid to get out? What kind of future, if this never passes, we may have the COVID-19 virus to live with the rest of our lives. Does that mean that we're to isolate ourselves completely? Is that what we're going to do? See, it's not just courage we need to face the world, the flesh, and the devil. It's not just courage we need to speak out against our president and our vice president. It's not just courage we need in our local community to speak the truth in love. It's courage that we need on a daily basis to face whatever we have to face. I, I, I think I'm acquainted with illness. Not like some people, but some things. And I want to cow down. I want to give in. My natural flesh is just like yours. I want to retreat but I need courage to press on. And you need courage to press on. I'm telling you, the oppression that's coming to our country, 
the threats that we know are coming to our country, the attitude of authorities we know that they already have that are an assault to everything we hold dear as Christians, and they are. They're an assault to everything we hold dear as Christians. Amen. What do we plan to do? We're going to have to rise up courageously and take a stand. You ever think how many churches have nearly closed? How many signs are on church buildings we no longer meet publicly? How many have quit coming to church when they were coming on a Wednesday night or a Sunday night? You ever think the shape that churches have gotten themselves into? The accommodations they've made to the circumstances and they're hanging on by a thread? It won't be long until you hear about buildings that have been used for church services everywhere that are for sale being disposed of or used for something else. It's happened all over the world and it'll happen here in America. We must rise to the moment and it takes courage. The Bible says Paul met some friends when he arrived at Rome and he thanked God and he took courage. You and I need to thank God and take courage. We must have courage. Ask yourself, am I a courageous person? Courage doesn't just go on when it's easy to go on. It rises in the face of danger. It faces the odds that are totally against them. There are risks involved, but courage takes you into them. It's like a sailor saying, I'm never going to sail again. I'm staying off the water completely because there might be a storm that takes us down. If a storm comes, you have to fight it. You have to go through it. You have to win over it. Now, we're not used to doing that in America. In America, we thought, well, we can get another four years, excuse me, out of Donald Trump. And it makes it easier for us. We don't have that. And you may be angry, and I may be angry at certain people for, for stands they did not take and for stands they did take. But nevertheless, it is what it is. And the Bible says, hope deferred maketh the heart sick. And so many of us had hope and it's been deferred. But what do we do as Christians? We're to thank God and take courage. I still believe the greatest moment for a Christian to be alive is this moment. If this doesn't send Christians to their knees, if this doesn't make people urgent about the time that we have, I don't think anything will. So that means you've got to speak up. You've got to speak on the job. And some of these people you know that don't, don't give a flip for the church anymore, I'm deeply concerned about them. I'm deeply concerned. I'm not talking about older people who are sheltered up at home, frightened. I'm talking about young, vibrant people who have every opportunity to be here and be a part of it, to be on the front lines fighting the good fight of faith. And you can't find them. That ought to disturb every Christian. We're in a war. And we need to thank God and take courage. I'm sorry if you think I'm awful for saying this. I'm sorry, but don't give me your flimsy excuses. No, no, not now. We're in a war. And it's going to be on, I think, for the rest of our lives. Take courage. Number two, get your confidence in the Lord. That moves it from political situations. That moves it from circumstances to the Lord. Look what the Bible says in the book of Acts. In the final expression God gives in verse 31 of chapter 28. 
preaching the kingdom of God and teaching those things which concern the Lord Jesus Christ with all confidence, no man forbidding him, with all confidence. I think that's plain enough. Our confidence must be in the Lord Jesus Christ. Is your confidence in the Lord Jesus? Well, if we could get two senators elected in Georgia and keep the Senate, well, we didn't get two senators elected in Georgia and keep the Senate. But we still have God on the throne. Amen. And we ought not be whining about all it forever and ever, talking about what went wrong. I can't believe any decent, God-fearing human being would have ever voted for either one of those people if you knew something about them. And I did everything I could. Made videos. They may come to find me. Videos. Everything I could do. Some of you saw it. Thousands of people watched them because I was working, doing all I could do. But they're sitting in the United States Senate now. And Chuck Schumer is now the head of it. And they will do as they please. They've got the deciding vote in the vice president of the United States and no one on earth has to wonder which way she's going. But my confidence must still be in God. Amen. If we don't get that right, listen, if we don't get that right, we're going to all be defeated for the rest of our lives. You know that's not the Lord's way. We can still live righteous in Rome. And we can live righteously in America no matter who's in office. That's the point I'm trying to make. We must keep our confidence in God. Then I want to show you something that's sort of buried in this first chapter. Paul is writing here. Of course, and we'll pick this up at verse 10 of chapter 1. Making request if by any means now at length I might have a prosperous journey by the will of God to come unto you. For I long to see you that I may impart unto you some spiritual gift to the end ye may be established. Notice verse 12. That is that I may be comforted together with you by the mutual faith, both of you and me. We need comfort. When I've been ill and couldn't be in the church and fellowship with God's people, it grieved me. It grieved me not to be able to be with God's people. When I hear the choir sing and lift my voice in hymns that we sing that honor the Lord. I'm comforted and strengthened. Are you? Amen. Are you? So that's what we need. We need a local church like a church like this that stands for the truth, that loves one another, that has people of faith who comfort one another. We need it. Courage, yes. Confidence in God, yes. But all of us are just weak enough that we need comfort from one another as Christian brothers and sisters in the Lord. This is the, this is the body of believers he's talking about. How we help one another. I'd like to say to you, stay in touch. When you come into a meeting, greet one another. Pray with one another. Tell one another what it means to have a Bible-believing, Bible-preaching church full of people who love God and want to serve God together. We're going into battle every day. The world, the flesh, and the devil's waiting out there. They're armed and ready for battle. We can't underestimate that. But greater is he that is in you and greater is he that's in me than he that's in the world. Amen. It never has meant so much to be a Christian, to have a Christian home, to get your children under the influence of God's word, 
have them growing up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. I mean, it truly is a banner that we wear in a lost and dying world. There have been other situations, other times in people's lives and history where people know that Christians have been in peril. And I'm not going to have some sort of complex to think everybody's out to get me. But I'm not going to be so ignorant I'm not aware that there are adversarial forces that are against us. And they're going to assault every value we have. And we're going to be reduced to nothing if those aren't really Bible-based convictions. Know what you believe and why you believe it. Because God is going to give us an opportunity to comfort one another. And I want you to know, if you haven't gotten the message, I want you to know, I'm just talking to you as a pastor, that we can live righteous in Rome. We can make it because God's designed us that way. We have the Holy Spirit living in us. We have access to God in prayer by faith. We have the resurrected Christ's power to call upon. Righteous in Rome. Let's live righteous in America. No matter what's happened. Pray with me, would you? And Father, I do pray that we won't be blown away by what we hear. That we won't be so disturbed by some of the news headlines, some of the things enacted, voted upon, that are so opposed to our Christian values. Help us to still live by our Christian values. Make this church greater than ever. Help us to be the most loving, the most steadfast, most abounding in the faith ever. Make it true, we pray. In Christ Jesus' name. Now we're going to pray together. How will you pray for your life? How will you pray for your loved ones? All of us know people who are fearful. They're going to have to have courage to get over that, get beyond it. Somebody says, I can't come because I'll get the COVID. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. How long do you plan to stay out of fellowship with God's people? And I know there are people listening to me through the social media means that are going to be disturbed by what I said. But what do you expect me to say? Every man must do according to his own conscience. I'm not trying to get him to violate his conscience. But we need courage to move on in the face of these things. Round up some people. Pray for them. Pray that God will touch their hearts and increase their faith. Well, they'll say, it's not a matter of faith. It's just being safe and taking care of my family. If that's their conviction, you can't do anything about that. But God can work giving you faith, courage to believe him. We need every soldier we've got to be on the firing line for the Lord, don't we? Yes. May God help us. And all the attack on our children. Nurture your children. Husband and wife, love your mate in their presence, show affection. Show them what God designed them for. Boys to be growing up to be men and girls growing up to be women. All of this is under attack today. May God help us. I want you to find someone that you've got confidence in and we're going to pray. Find someone now you've got confidence in and we're going to pray. I want all of our deacons who are here to please stand. All of them.
stand. Good. Good. I want you men to leave your places. Some of you now. If you can, I want you to come up here. We're going to pray together. Come on. And I want us to pray. We're going to pray for our nation. The President of the United States was impeached today by the United States Congress. Foolish action. He's got a handful of days left. Foolish action. It'll come back to haunt them. But we're going to pray. This is not just a building. It's not just people. It is a church. It's not just a crowd. It's a church of baptized believers who voluntarily join themselves together. And I want you to find someone you can pray with now. And you gentlemen just come one by one. Lead us in prayer. Lead me in prayer. We're going to pray together. And God will guide us and help us. Ed's going to lead us here first. I've asked Ed if he will help me. I'm talking about leave his job as an engineer and help me minister to our senior citizens, our senior friends. He's agreed to do it. In the next few days, we're working out all the details. He already for many years has had a ministry with senior saints in residence centers. Been a bus captain for years. His whole family's involved in it. I want you to pray for him. We want to minister to our people. They're hurting. They're hurting. They want to be here. And the media has turned on many of them to scare them to death. But they've got to get confidence that they can do that. Sit in the second auditorium in the Curtis Hutchins Chapel or whatever they need to do. Well, let's move forward. Let's pray. Would you find your prayer partner right now? Come on, all of us. Let's make it count. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you, Lord, for this Bible preaching church where we can meet together and hear the word of God. We thank you for our pastor and um, just pray your blessing on him, that you would strengthen him. Give us all, Lord, courage um, for the days ahead and also a great confidence in thee, Lord. And, Lord, I pray that um, we would comfort one another as Christians and um, that you would uh, use our church, Lord, to, to make a great impact more than ever before in our communities uh, with our the children and the families, Lord, who are um, going to be targeted for destruction by those that work against all things that are go godly. Um, Lord, help us to speak the truth in love and just pray that you would bless and use us as individuals and as a church. And we ask this in Jesus' precious name. Heavenly Father, thank you for the promises from your word that we've heard tonight that you're always there, that you're in control. Thank you for the assurance that we as Christians have. And Lord, I pray that we will remember that now more than ever, and that will em empower us and embolden our testimony to those that live around us. That in, in times of, of darkness in our world and our society, Lord, that they will see a shining light upon a hill in the lives that we live. Thank you for our pastor and the uh, message that he preached, Lord. I know it took courage to do that, but Lord, it's a reminder that your word has the truth that we need for our lives. And so we just pray for um, uh, our, our pastor, our leadership here. We pray for, pray for those that are in government, Lord. They need you. And I just pray that we will uh, consistently uh, point all people to you. Pray for Brother Ed and um, as he works with our pastor and ministering to senior citizens, Lord, and that we can help and reach people um, and encourage people and just help our membership, Lord, to be emboldened and encouraged to be faithful to you and faithful to this church. We pray this in your precious holy name. Amen. Lord, as we uh, continue to thank you and praise you for this opportunity that we have, we have an opportunity to show the world that there's a, a real God in heaven 
who hears and answers prayer. We thank you that we know beyond a shadow of a doubt that we're on the winning side and we don't have to worry about the end result. That if we lay it on the line with you that you'll, you'll take care of us, your will will be done as we follow you. I pray for this church and for our families. I pray that we'll have confidence to uh, speak the truth. And uh, you said you'd never leave us nor forsake us, and we, we know that. Mm -hmm. And if we uh, uh, are talked about or we're uh, abused in some way verbally or uh, consequently, that makes no difference if we're doing it for your honor and glory. I pray for uh, those folks that are still unafraid, they are afraid to come to church now, that you'll give them boldness. Help us to stand for truth. Help us to share it with others. And, ha and I pray for strength for the pastor as he follows you and, and leads this church. We love you. Thank you for all that you're going to do ahead of time. In Christ's name. Heavenly Father, we do thank you for all that we do know about you. Thank you for your great love toward us. Lord, we thank you for what we've learned in this place and, Father, what we've been handed. And I pray you help us to be able to preserve those things, the truths, the body of doctrine for the next generations. That the torch may keep shining bright. Father, we pray you help us and do our part, stand strong, to be courageous to show your love to this lost and dying world. We need you. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Dear Heavenly Father, just thank you, Lord, for the opportunity you've given us tonight, Lord, to join together as a church family, Lord. And thank you, Lord, for the, the message we just heard our pastor preach. I pray, Lord, that you would just help us to uh, just to be courageous, Lord, especially during this year, I pray that you'd help us as we go out in the community with the different ministries, Lord, we're uh, able to have, and especially with the, the bus ministry, Lord, where we can reach families of, of children that are in these public schools, Lord, that are going to be going through these different changes. I pray, Lord, that you would just help us, Lord, as, as Christians, Lord, just to, to point them to you. Help us, Lord, to just to be courageous, Lord, and not to, to shy away or to step back, but, Lord, to, to point them to you, to the gospel, Lord. And I pray that you'd help our pastor continue to strengthen him, continue to give him health, help him, Lord, as he, he leads us uh, during this year. And I pray, Lord, that you would just continue to, to help this church, Lord, just to be a shining beacon for you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Heavenly Father, I thank you, Lord, for this church. I thank you, Lord, especially for the ministries and opportunities that we have to serve you. And I pray, Lord, you help us not take that uh, for granted, that you'd help us to, to use those ministries to, to your glory and to as much as we can and to be a witness for you through them, Lord, but also on a daily basis uh, throughout the work and the job and, and the people we meet every day, that we'd just be a witness for you through all this, Lord, as people will be searching and looking, Lord, and help us to be ready to give them an answer, Lord, and to, to share you with them. I thank you so much for all you've done for us. Amen. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we love you, Lord, and we thank you for this church and for the message tonight, for Pastor. We pray, Lord, that you would uh, guide and direct us as we go out from this place. Help us to be bold witnesses for you. Help us to be courageous, to speak the truth and love to those we meet. Pray, Lord, that... Uh, a difference would be made in our country, Lord, and that uh, that our country would repent and, and turn to you, Lord, and I pray that you would would uh, help us, Lord, to, uh, to, to, to tell others about you and to be found faithful, and we pray this in Christ Jesus' name, amen. Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you, Lord, for your blessings. We thank you for a church that's not afraid to stand up for you, for a pastor that's not afraid to tell the truth like it should be. We just pray now, Lord, that you would help each one of us to grow closer to you and to, to have this, the guidance and the fortitude to stand up for what we know is right. We pray that you would be with our country 
Lord, I pray you'd have mercy on us one more yes. time. I know we don't deserve it. We've done everything we can to, to tear our country down, but we need your help, Lord. And I just pray that you'd give each one of us here in this church and in this town the courage to stand up for what we know is right and what we know that you want us to do. Help us to reach out to the people. Pray that you would be with uh, all of our all of our uh, senior people, Lord, I understand. I know you understand, but we pray that you'd give them boldness to stand up for you and, and to seek your leadership. Pray now you'd go with us, continue to touch the pastor, strengthen him, keep your hands upon him, bless each thing that we do, that it'd be done right and it'd be done for your glory. And we'll ask these things in Jesus' name. Lord, we thank you, Lord, for our church. We thank you for our church family. Thank you that we are a family, Lord. And we just pray that we'll love one another even more than we have. Help us to care for one another. Help others to see the love we have for you, Lord, and the love for each other. They want to be a part of it. Open our hearts to what you want us to do. Open our mouths, Lord, to give us confidence and uh, courage, Lord. And we just pray. I even think now, Gary Pedot, I just pray you'll work in his life and his health. Bless his wife. Bless Mary Lou. Just please give them strength right now. I just thank you, Lord, for our pastor. Thank you, Lord, he's back with us. Continue to give him strength and give him wisdom, Lord, as he leads our church. Help us to stand with him. Again, Lord, we just love you. We love our church. I just pray you'll give us a greater love for you, and through that we'll have a greater love for each other. We thank you, Lord. Thank you for a place to come and hear your word preached. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand together, may we? Before we meet again, Gary Padat will be gone to heaven. So pray for Mary Lou and Renee's daughter. She's with him. They brought him home to the hospital today. And they've given him less than two days to live. Gary Padat is a faithful man. He has proven his Christian faith by his steadfastness. I want you to pray with me about this. We have an auditorium over here that seats 350 people. And we have some people who go in there because they don't feel comfortable coming in here. But perhaps we could work diligently to make that a safe place just to return for some of our senior citizens. More room. Um, maybe they feel more comfortable with that. I don't want to shame somebody into coming. That's not the way to do it because they're legitimate about their concerns. But you and I both know that if people stay away and just keep staying away and keep staying away, we say we miss them. I'm convinced they miss being here more than we miss them. So let's try. And some of you who want to help me with that, help me with that. Uh, we don't need you to overload the place because that's the thing we're trying to avoid. But we can air everything we're doing in there. They can enjoy seeing one another, stay safe. We can disinfect everything that needs to be done. So we're doing that anyway. Well, let's work at it. I'm going to speak on pressing on on Sunday. And the fact is, the last line of opposition is people like you and me. If we weren't here and people like us weren't here, then the flood tide of all of it, they just have their way. And we want to go in the strength of the Lord and show them that uh, there are people who still won't take a stand and do it in the right spirit. So pray with me about it, would you please? Father, bless our church, raise it to greater heights for thy glory. Help us to find all we need in thee. Help us to live righteously right where we are, no matter what surrounds us. In thy loving name we pray, amen. Thank you for being here. Thank you for listening. God bless you.